Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, wherever you are joining us from. Welcome to this event, Putting People at the Heart, Assessing the Global State of Play for Responsible Business Conduct, which marks the publication of WBA's Social Transformation Baseline. My name is Camille Lepos, and I work at WBA, where I lead the Corporate Human Rights Benchmark, or CHRB. With the CHRB, we have been assessing the human rights disclosures of the largest global companies in high-risk sectors since 2017. And over the years, we have seen that some companies take their responsibility to respect human rights very seriously, with some clear improvements over time. But we have also seen that the majority of companies are not doing enough, and that whenever we add new companies in scope of the benchmark, their results tend to be low, actually back to 2017 levels or lower the very first iteration of the benchmark. For example, we assessed automotive companies for the first time in 2020, and the average for the sector was 12%, the lowest ever, whereas companies in the agricultural and apparel sectors that had been assessed since 2017 had seen their average score improve significantly to about over 30%. And this has been one of the lessons from the CHRB experience. When companies are put on notice, they tend to improve, but this stops at the companies in scope of the benchmark. And so we deci decided to go from 230 companies assessed on CHRB to 2,000 companies assessed on core social metrics. And by increasing the scope so dramatically from 230 to 2,000, we want to keep the most influential global companies accountable for their impact on people. So today, we are really proud to publish the baseline study, looking at the first thousand companies in the group, and are delighted to share our key findings with you through this event. After this short introduction, I will hand over to my colleague, Daniel, who leads the social transformation at WBA, to take us through the framework and the key findings. We will then show a video featuring some of our allies to put the results into context and remind everyone in the audience of why these topics matter, what they mean concretely and why they are important. We will then in, go into a panel to discuss the results, but also what should be done to drive positive change. On the panel, we will hear from four brilliant speakers, Vaidi Sashdev, Senior Impact Analyst and Social Pillar Lead at Aviva Investors. Tara Van Ho, Senior Lecturer at the University of Essex School of Law and Human Rights Center. James Gomer, Director of Equity Action at the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. And Andres Zaragoza, Program Manager for Business and Human Rights at the International Service for Human Rights. The panel will be followed by a Q&A. So I invite all of you in the audience to send your questions to Dan or to any of our panelists using the Q&A box or the chat function at the bottom of the Zoom screen. We will do our best to get to your question in the Q&A, but if we don't have time to cover it live, we will do our best to answer it in writing through the Q&A box. Just before I hand over to Dan to take us through the results, there is one more thing for me to do which is to invite all of you to spread the words, the word about today's event and the baseline findings with the hashtag when companies value people, which you can see on the slide on screen. Please include the hashtag in a tweet or if you don't use Twitter on LinkedIn and make sure to tag WBA in your post. So for example, you could tweet hashtag when companies value people they do everything in their power to end social inequalities in their operations and supply chain. Yet, WBA research shows that out of a thousand companies, only 1% are meeting the basics of socially responsible business conduct. You can look out in the chat for a link to a toolkit with visuals and sample tweets. So let's try to create a bit of a Twitter storm um, around what should happen when companies value people. And on this note, I'll hand over to you, Dan, to take us through how 1,000 of the world's most influential companies perform on the fundamental expectations of responsible business conduct. Thank you, and Dan, the floor is yours. Thank you, Camille, and welcome. It's great to see so many people. I think we had over 700 signed up across more than 50 countries, which is fantastic. 
Before getting into the results themselves, it's important to get on the same page and do some framing. Humanity is facing three massive and interconnected risks of climate change, destruction of the natural world and social inequality. While COP26 showcased the huge efforts to address the systemic risk of climate change, inequality doesn't yet have that same level of recognition. The pandemic has highlighted the problem of inequality, with income inequality turning out to be a, pre a better predictor of death from COVID than, than age. And while during the pandemic, the wealth of the very richest has doubled. The lack of recognition of this systemic risk, despite humanity's long history of inequality linked to conflict, reflects the S in sustainability being the poor cousin and the third in line after climate and nature to be addressed. The real tragedy of this is that it's only by addressing the social side that we can also sex successfully address the challenges of climate change and nature loss. If people are not part of every step of the solution, they will likely prevent the transformation if they feel threatened by it or at risk of being left behind. We have useful targets to address these risks in the form of the SDGs and the Paris Agreement, and we need companies to help get there. But to get there, we need to transform the systems that business operate within, benefit from, and indeed shape. To reach the targets, companies have to be part of the systems transformations in WBA's model. To ensure that no one is left behind and these transformations are just, WBA places people and social at the heart of the model. Over the last two years, WBA has established and rolled out its approach to putting social at the heart of systems transformation. And this baseline is a moment to reflect on what we found. Our work with the social transformation aims to incentivize responsible business practices, which underpin inclusive and equitable economies and enable systems transformations that leave no one behind. The framework sets out our approach, including 12 high level expectations, what we need from all of our companies in scope. These are grouped in three broad areas, building on respect for human rights, we bring in decent work and ethical conduct with the expectations in the gray box around them. These also reflect certain social performance thresholds. So respecting human rights, including the elimination of forced and child labor, achieving diversity balance within company leadership, and paying a living wage or a fair amount of tax are all lower thresholds that companies should meet. This red wheel is then what we need from companies to do as opposed to a disclosure framework. When companies are meeting these expectations, they'll be well placed to support equitable and just transformations, and they'll be met when companies truly value people. In terms of what we're assessing, within the framework, there's a series of 18 core social indicators, which you see on the right hand side. They're designed to apply to all companies in all industries and all geographies. They point towards the expectations, drawing on a subset of the corporate human rights benchmark, as well as some fundamental requirements for decent work and ethical action. Although we call them fundamentals, please don't think they're easy, they're not, but they are necessary. And they're what we think are the minimum for companies to show that they value people and are on the path to meeting those high level expectations. We've been integrating these indicators into the other system transformation methodologies to ensure that the principle of leave no one behind is embedded in those transformation benchmarks. If we now turn to where this baseline fits uh, within that transformation, we've got the expectations in those three areas of human rights, decent work and ethical conduct. And then we have the, the worst for you, you know, that companies may be legally compliant, but they're not ready to support the transformations in a way that leaves no one behind. The CSIs are between the two uh, where they're fully met and they act, if you like, as a driving license. They're quite binary in terms of does a company do X, yes or no. They're less of a proxy for good performance and more of a minimum standard, which is why we don't rank companies in the report. As an analogy, if a ranking based on performance is like the results from a competition at the Olympics, showing who is top and bottom of the leaderboard, meeting the core social indicators show which athletes have actually qualified to take part in the competition or the race, including passing things like their drugs tests, and are then ready to compete and to reach the expectations. The baseline shows where companies fall in the space between meeting all the core social indicators and being at the very bottom in black. In terms of the scope of what we're looking at, it's quite broad. So last year we researched 1000 companies drawn from our food benchmarks, our energy benchmarks and the digital inclusion benchmarks. We've also included some companies that will be looked at this year in the financial sector and the nature transformation. They represent more than a quarter of global GDP from 26 industries, almost 70 countries, with all the numbers that you can see there. And this is the stuff that's, that's all available online. Before getting into the results, um, I want to go through some of the baseline findings. Sorry, uh, before going through the results, I need to show what we're actually sharing. 
So we've published two things today. The first is the report that provides a high level overview at the global level, focusing on the themes of the assessment. And I'll go into some of the key findings in a moment. The second is a downloadable data set, which has all of the companies by their sector, HQ country, overall thematic and indicator scores, and also the sub indicator requirement scores. All of this is under a Creative Commons license, so it can be used by third parties. In terms of the report, you'll note we aren't naming and shaming companies or highlighting specific countries. That data is all there to make the comparisons. For instance, you could see huge variations between and within countries and sectors. That additional analysis will follow, but for today, we're focused on the big global picture. In addition, and to drive engagement with interested stakeholders, plus track who's using our data better, we will share the underlying data, which explains why each of those indicator requirements have been met. This is over 30,000 individual commentaries. It's quite weighty and it is available. People just have to ask and engage with us to get it. So that's the framing and the resources, but what does it actually say? Well, if we get rid of the expectations for a second and focus on the core social data, we can pull out an average score per measurement area. And across the three thematic measurement areas, we see that on average, each score less than a third of the maximum potential. I wouldn't focus too much on the score differences, but instead focus on the size of the gap, the gray bit that's left, that shows how far we have to go to get to that driving license. Averages can hide a multiple of uh, sins, but I want to reinforce the fact that the core social indicators represent the floor where we need everyone to be, the minimum threshold on which to build positive impact and support transformations for a sustainable future. Overall, we can say that at a global level, the majority of companies fail to demonstrate they're meeting the fundamental expectations of socially responsible business conduct. And this has implications for things like the Build Back Better narrative. So if the overall picture is that most companies are failing to pass that test that gets them into the race, in terms of building back better, it's very hard to see how that's going to be successful with such a weak foundation of responsible business conduct. Without those strong foundations, we'll never be able to build back better, nor address the structural issues that meant our economies were so fragile when COVID struck in the first place. In terms of the house, as we build back, we can't afford to spend our time focusing on the colour of the curtains when the foundations of our house are sitting on sand and crumbling. If we turn to look at the score distribution, um, we have a maximum score of 20 points and you can get half points so you see all the different potential scores on the bottom here. The number of companies per score are shown in the red bars. The average score is five out of 20. And despite experience with previous assessments, even I was surprised at how low that average score was. Um, realistically, we need all companies to be up here to meet the fundamentals. If a company was doing everything, but only disclosing most of it, or doing nearly everything and being highly transparent, we'd see them about the 15 mark. So that's where we've drawn a line where companies are mostly meeting most of the requirements as a bit of a marker to show how far off the pace we are with a thousand companies. Unfortunately, only 1% of companies are on the right side of the line with 99% failing to make the grade. In fact, only 10% of companies get more than halfway, i.e. they could be fully meeting half of the requirements or partially meeting all of the requirements. This doesn't paint a very positive picture, but it does lead to some useful conclusions as well. One is the gap in meaningful social disclosures by companies. In meaningful, I'm talking about the difference between having a policy on human rights and having a policy commitment that respects human rights, i.e. the things that we look for in the indicators. As we see across all of the indicator requirements, 116 companies didn't meet a single one. And if we give them the benefit of the doubt and assume that they are doing some of the right stuff and still scoring zero, it follows that they just can't be saying the right things. The absence of meaningful data that people can use to help make decisions and understand a company's social performance supports the need for consistent mandatory disclosures. I say this while there's a huge push on ESG and sustainability reporting standards and guidance which show a fractured landscape. Hopefully the findings from the baseline will be timely and useful in supporting the push for better universal disclosures. And while we support that idea to be meaningful and to drive informed decision making, these disclosure standards must be contextualized by sustainability thresholds, such as achieving gender balance, paying a living wage, et cetera. There's 18 indicators and loads of data, but I'm only gonna focus on a few in the next few slides and leave you to read the report for yourself. Going to the, uh, the third area of ethical conduct and touching on corporate influence, trust and transparency, we say that businesses have significant influence in supporting or undermining the social foundations of society. And they can also support or hinder the crucial systems transformations. 
Two key ways they have influence is via their approaches to taxation and lobbying. These topics are sometimes ignored under social with a focus on things like diversity, equity and inclusion in sustainability strategies. But if a company's political influence undermines labour standards or if their tax policy harms the ability of governments to provide essential services to people, then really the sustainability strategy arguably doesn't matter much. It's maybe focusing on the curtains rather than the strong foundations. And this reflects our thinking with the core social data as a whole, that if the basics aren't being met, then any of a company's self-declared social impact should be viewed through a skeptical lens of green or impact or SDG or pink or rainbow washing, take your pick. If we turn to what we look at, at the expe expectation level on tax, we want companies to be paying a fair amount. That is the right amount at the right time in the right place. Stepping back from that, and what the core social indicators look at, you know, we require companies to have a publicly available tax approach and to disclose the amount of tax paid in each and every jurisdiction where they're resident for tax purposes. Three quarters of companies don't have that public approach and only 9% of companies disclose sufficient tax information. On a flip side, we can say that almost 100 companies are transparent, so it's not an impossible task at all. On lobbying, it's a similar picture. Only a fifth of companies publish their approach to lobbying and only 8% of companies show how much they're actually spending on lobbying and influencing the political system. But again, a proportion of companies do. This is reflected through all of the social indicators. They are possible and some companies are doing it. Turning back to influence, this lack of transparency must be sorted, not just to help address the trust deficit, which has got in the news quite a lot recently, but also to enable stakeholders to understand a company's true influence and its impact on society, plus the likelihood of achieving sustainable development. If we go to the second area of decent work, building on the respect for human rights, decent work, we look at fundamentals of health and safety, living wages, working hours, collective bargaining, workforce disclosures and gender equality. Each of these indicators has sub requirements, so they can be met, fully met or not met at all. The lack of dark red you see in the picture there means very few companies are meeting all of the elements. And the light red means that many are meeting some of the minimum expectations. The size of the gray bars is the worrying bit, and the hundreds of companies they represent. It makes us ask how highly do companies value their own value creators? As they've all got sub requirements, you can pull out um, additional data points from the data set, which everyone can do with the, the way it's been published. And we see a small cluster of companies in this 4% club. So there's 40 out of 1,000 companies who disclose sufficient data on fatalities, injuries, and lost time rates for their workers. 4% disclose a global living wage target or they already pay their employees a living wage. 4% say they limit excessive working hours and only 4% disclose gender pay gaps for their employee categories. An initial starting point to understand the scale of the problem to address gender inequality. No companies do all of these things at the same time. There's variations on the phrase that staff are our greatest asset and we hear that quite a lot. But if that's the case, then companies seem to have a funny way of showing it. Um, at WBA, we see living wages as a decent work topic that is an exceptional catalyst. It's relevant across all countries and sectors, and its achievement supports both multiple SDGs and also enables families to break out of poverty, helping to address social inequalities. It also supports wider economic resilience. The precarious nature of work, the systemic undervaluing of workers and the lack of resilience were repeatedly highlighted during the pandemic. And we're very keen to work with allies on a global living wage effort starting with holding the Keystone companies accountable for their commitments and performance within their own companies. Look out for more on a living wage in 2022 as we try and shift companies beyond that 4% mark. As a final finding, we go back to the first measurement area, human rights. Respect for human rights underpins a company's ability to provide decent work. It contributes to the SDGs or eliminate discrimination and address both salient and material social risks and impacts. It is a bedrock of responsible business conduct. The system for embedding the respect for human rights, the UN Guiding Principles or UNGPs, provides a holistic framework to understand and manage social risks and impacts across the whole of a company's operations and value chain. For the fundamentals, companies can score points against a subset of the CHRB methodology, which looks at evidence of commitments and processes to embed respect for human rights through due diligence, engagement and remedy mechanisms. While just over half of companies made a high level policy commitment to respect human rights, this doesn't translate to actions. In assessing if companies identify, assess, and act on human rights risks, we found only 7% did all those steps. 15% got some of the way, while 78% of these keystone companies met none of the human rights due diligence requirements. 
Due diligence enables companies to identify, prevent, mitigate, and account for how they address their impacts on human rights. So that 7% is a, is a concerning number. And it's quite hard to wrap your head around it. If I said three quarters of companies can't show that they have a way of dealing with their impacts on the environment, then it might strike home as an equivalent. And that's the size of the gap we need to address. More than a decade since the UN GPs were launched, this data really supports the calls for mandatory human rights due diligence to create a level playing field for companies. The mix of national level legislation um, on different topics and in different elements of the value chain have not sufficiently shifted the needle and a more holistic approach is needed. As an example of things that can be pulled out um, from, the, from the data set, this graph quickly shows the average score across 18 European countries for the human rights indicators. There's a range within each country, of course, some go from zero up to the maximum of 10. And there's a huge variation across countries, even within the EU. So remember 10 is the minimum expectation at this stage. So you see an interesting picture. This data would be relevant for anyone interested in the mandatory human rights due diligence legislation, as it shows the overall poor performance, as well as the variance across different member states. It also shows how few companies are from our perspective, disclosing enough to show that they are dealing with social impacts in line with the expectations of the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive. Finally, the EU Sustainable Finance Taxonomy sees sustainable activities as those in line with safeguards, including the UNGPs and ILO core labour standards. If a company was adequately demonstrated, demonstrating it was committed to those core labour standards and implementing the UNGPs, their scores should be up in that red band. The picture shows just how far away most European companies are as a whole from demonstrating that they meet these minimum safeguards. I pulled out these bits as a regional focus because of the current momentum in the EU, but we can do that in similar things for lots of different topics and geographies. That was a really quick run through and a broad overview. So a few reminders before we move on. Firstly, while most of the expectations are a long way from being met, all of them are being met by someone. Nothing's impossible, there just needs to be the right incentives. Secondly, the data gaps are preventing meaningful disclosures of sustainable, sustainability performance. So we support mandatory disclosures that reflect threshold thinking. The scores though have wider implications than just for social transformation and inequality and companies' relationship to that. For example, with the foundations of a just transition not being in place, the success of the decarbonization and energy system transformation will be threatened. And finally, to say that you know, this scratches the surface of the actual data. So we encourage people to follow up and begin using it. This is a baseline from which we can build insights, new benchmarks, sectoral and geographic analysis. So if you wanna create a benchmark that looks at just decent work in Japan and the 70 companies there, that can be done or just tax and lobbying for the, for the digital sector. There's a lot of potential with the data and hopefully the spin-offs will support the aim of incentivizing companies to act responsibly in support of systems transformations which leave no one behind and to help companies show that they value people. Before we go to the panel, can we mention that we've got a, a couple video clips. These are going to discuss how action, um, sorry, it's too easy to get wrapped up in, in the numbers rather than what they mean to people. So to bring us back to people before the panel, we wanted to bring in some voices from our allies and a couple of core social topics. Let's hear from them now. So if the team can hit play. In the last four years at Safe in India, we have helped more than 3,000 workers who have got injured in their workplaces, 80% of them in auto sector supply chain. It is pretty clear to us that this is not just a human tragedy, but this is a loss of productivity to the country and to those businesses. We do two key things. First, we publish a series of reports with this evidence that we have. We have crushed 2019, crushed 2020, and now crushed 2021 with this evidence of 3,000 workers. We also publish a report called Safety Niti, which is about the OSH policies of top 10 auto sector brands in India and making recommendations based on the gaps that we have identified in these policies. I think one of the biggest changes that can be made by any business is take the OSH issue seriously enough to be on standard agenda of your boards. I wonder how many board members sit together and actually discuss safety and along with that productivity of the workers in their own factories and in their supply chain. 
unless the very top management of a business takes this into serious consideration, the chances of improvement are going to be very low. If corporations are not paying their fair share, the burden is tilted towards the vulnerable, the very people you want to protect. A low corporate income tax means most of these countries have to rely solely on indirect taxes like VAT, levies, we tend to affect poor the most. Oxfam is working with its partners here in Ghana. And what we want to do to change the narrative is what the project we call the tax dialogue, i.e. the Ghana tax dialogue. We use the tax dialogue as a mechanism to engage multinationals and big players within the country, sit down and dialogue with them on the need to be tax responsible. Here we are not looking at just paying taxes and ticking the boxes, but we go beyond that of legal compliance and see if companies are disclosing one, the exemptions they are enjoying, they are publishing their tax strategy, and all key indicators which will define and make an organization a tax responsible. Increasing corporate tax revenue into government coffers will have a direct impact on citizens because citizens will no longer be paying the substantial amount they are paying now towards building their country, which is collected through indirect taxes, i.e. burdening the poor the most, the very people we seek to protect. Thank you very much, Dan, for taking us through the results. Um, I particularly like the Curtains and House Foundation analogy, the new take on greenwashing. Um, and many thanks also to our allies for sending us these videos so that we could look beyond the numbers. Um, we're now going to move into the panel discussion. Um, and I'm really pleased to be joined today by four excellent speakers and close partners. Uh, to discuss the results, but also what we should do about them. Because uh, it's one thing having this data, now we need to use it to drive progress. And we won't be able to deliver any of this much needed change if we work in silos or in isolation. And we therefore have four speakers representing different stakeholder groups, uh, but with at least one thing in common between them, which is a concern for responsible business conduct. We've got Tara Van Ho, who is a senior lecturer at the University of Essex School of Law and Human Rights Centre, co-director of the Essex Business and Human Rights Project, and co-president of the Global Business and Human Rights Scholars Association. Tara has also served on the CHRB Appeals Committee, and it's also Tara's birthday today, so we are especially honoured uh, that you wanted to spend this time with us, Tara, um, and I wanted to wish you a very happy birthday. We also have Vaidi Sashdev, uh, who's uh, with us from Aviva. Vaidi uh, joined Aviva Investors uh, just over a year ago as social pillar lead. Um, and this pillar sits within Aviva Investors' sustainable outcomes team, which also has a climate and biodiversity pillar. Vaidi's work involves integrating human rights and labor rights considerations into Aviva's investment process and stewardship activities. Um, and increasingly, this means looking beyond financial materiality uh, as the primary lens to, to understand uh, investment risk. Prior to this, Vaidi worked at Share Action on the Workforce Disclosure Initiative. We are also joined by Andres Saragosa, who has been leading the business and human rights work at the International Service for Human Rights since 2020. And previously, Andres worked at the World Economic Forum and uh, with a few NGOs. And along his career, he has focused on the implementation of human rights due diligence along global supply chains and in high risk areas. Andres also worked at the International, International Code of Conduct for Private Security Providers, um, a multi stakeholder initiative involving private sector, states, and NGOs in raising standards in the private security sector globally. And last but not least, uh, James Comis, Director of Equity Action at the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, WBCSD, and currently heads up WBCSD's work around 
the social side of sustainable development, um, working with forward-thinking global companies and their leaders to drive systemic transformation in support of shared prosperity for all. And James also leads uh, WBCSD's work on the Business Commission to tackle inequality, uh, BCTI, a cross-sectoral coalition of global thought leaders that are working together to mobilize the private sector to address uh, inequality. So thank you again to the four of you for joining us today. Um, to get this panel started, I'd like to ask all of you to comment on the results um, and the findings that Dan just shared. Uh, essentially, what are your reactions to the baseline assessment? What does this mean to you and your work? Um, why does it matter? And Tara, can we go to you first? Sure. Thanks, Kami, and thanks for the birthday wishes. Um, I have to admit that I was sad and perhaps disappointed in the results and not surprised at all. I think that there are three things that can explain some of the underpinning uh, problems that have led to, to the results being what they are. The first is that I think companies continue to try to intuit their way to human rights compliance. So they, they define human rights as what makes them feel good rather than what they actually have to do for society. Um, there's still a bit of a confusion between corporate social responsibility and human rights. Human rights have content to them. They have de definition. They require processes. They require people. They require investment. And so trying to add it on to your business rather than integrating it into your business is something that I think a lot of businesses do, and it leads to this very fragile foundation that Dan was talking about. Um, I have to say, I, I get a little frustrated with this because you would never trust me, you should never trust me with the financial auditing of a company. And yet what we often see is that people who don't have the training in the background within human rights to help define the content, to help assess the quality, to understand the processes, are the ones who are being brought into these positions and given authority within a business. And that's that's never going to work out in the long run. It will always give you these, these low scores or non-compliant scores. When they do have human rights teams, businesses oftentimes tend to uh, put them lower down within the corporate structure. So you rarely see a chief human rights officer sitting next to the chief commercial officer, or the chief supply chain officer. What you tend to have are directors of human rights. They have a little less power. Their positions are not integrated into the corporate decision making. And again, when you have that, you're going to end up with low results. Um, and then we finally have the fact that states uh, still have not required businesses to undertake the rigorous reform that's needed. To comply with business and human rights, to, to comply with those social indicators, requires more than just goodwill or interest. It actually requires a, a significant structural and substantive reform within the decision-making processes within the business. And states have the ability to force that. We know that because, again, if we go back to that financial auditing, it's not, it's not really the case where all businesses felt that they wanted to invest in financial auditing the way that they have. That is the result of regulatory reform and regulatory impetus. A lot of corporate decision-making is framed around and in response to regulatory responsibilities. And so I'd like to see states develop that a little bit more because that's going to help reform some of these numbers. Um, I want to compliment World Benchmarking Alliance. I, I say this about them behind their backs a lot. I finally get to say it to their faces, which is I am somebody who is naturally skeptical of uh, trying to quantify human rights. And yet, when I was asked to step on the appeals committee, when I was asked to do this present this this panel today, um, I do my own human rights due diligence. I check out how much I believe in what someone is doing. Uh, and and I and I'm somebody who I, I like to think has a reputation of being a little bit blunt when she presents. So uh, I'm happy to criticize where criticism is needed, even when it's uncomfortable. And yet there is this consistency within your methodology that that gives me confidence in the results. So when I'm pointing to these underlying um, issues with the corporate structure and with the state compliance as being the reason that we we're seeing the results that we are, it's because the answer is not within the methodological issues, right? So it is not the case where um, businesses can escape the responsibility by saying, oh, it's 
a problem with the data or, oh, it's a problem with the numbers or the methodology. This is actually a problem that is intrinsic in current corporate structures. And I think um, we need to find a way past those underpinning results if we wanna see, see these numbers get lifted. So thanks, Kami. Great, thank you very much, Tara, and, and thank you for, for your comments on, on the methodology um, and also on the importance of regulation as, as a driving force. And I'm sure we'll get into that um, even more when we get to the forward-looking uh, thinking of solutions. Um, Andres, can I go to you next? With the same questions for now, we'll do a round. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Thanks so much for the invitation. And I will build into some of Tara's comments. Um, Again, uh, congratulations for the publication of this. Um, I, I believe this is what is needed. We are in an age of people looking at data and clarity and, and, and clear information to kind of assess their decision making. And I think this type of methodology is quite strong and targeted to, to, uh, to those that are paying attention, investors, consumers, uh, media and others that now finally we have a we have a place where, where we can find these, these rankings and we can find this information and the methodology is really, really strong. Um, so apart from that, I mean, um, the, the, the reactions that I have from, from our International Service for Human Rights, it's quite disappointing with the conclusions of the, of the results of the research. Uh, it's a pity to see that companies continue to uh, have maybe shiny statements that do not translate into actual policies that in itself kind of internalize into management systems. So there's always the perception that um, those systems are not connected to the operations of the company. And uh, I can say that when we interact sometimes with um, some of the businesses that we work with, uh, we run the business network on civic freedoms and human rights defenders, and we analyze and, and try to uh, highlight the importance of, of, of civil society in, in business operations and in, in business environments. And very often we see that when some situation happens, when uh, a company gets in trouble, those that are responsible for human rights are really removed from the reality. They are not in the room where operational decisions are made. So all that work is a bit in a vacuum. and. and and then that's a that's a that's a concern and that's a pity because there's a huge disconnect um, from our side. Uh, we see this as the the trends that you highlight as concerning. Uh, from our side, we see uh, civil civil society being a core actor within a business environment. We believe that defenders should be key stakeholders when consultations happen. Consultations have to happen in a meaningful way. Uh, human rights defenders are a source of information, a source of a, a temperature of the social environment in a country, in a market. And we have been working with companies that have a progressive view on this, and we see that they see the value. And uh, in my opinion, I think the companies that score really low on, on this ranking and others, uh, they are slightly short-sighted, that they do not see that there's this huge trend coming uh, with upcoming regulation at the EU, um, an increasing relevance of ESG scoring and data gathering and rankings like yours and others, and that consumers and investors are looking and that uh, they will have to be ready for, for this legislation sooner or later. And a lot of these companies are not are clearly not ready. So um, again, um, slightly negative uh, feelings about the results. Happy to see this work being done. Happy to see investors like our colleagues in the panel today paying attention to human rights indicators. That's huge uh, and good news. And I think there's opportunity for action through uh, joining some of the initiatives that you guys are pushing at the World Benchmarking Alliance, joining our network of civic freedoms and human rights defenders and, and other work that is doing, uh, that's being developed. So I'll leave it there and then uh, colleagues, and compliment and looking forward to the questions from from the audience great thank you very much andres and thank you for highlighting the importance of uh, stakeholder engagement and particularly engaging with uh, potentially affected and affected stakeholders that's um, definitely something we've seen in the past through the data is companies that do uh, stakeholder engagement 
properly tend to do better overall. Um, you mentioned that it's great to have investors at the table, so I think that's a natural transition to you, Vaidi. Um, over to you. Thank you, Kumi, and happy birthday, Tara. Um, so I suppose it's natural for you to receive compliments or, you know, at a launch event from your panelists, but I just wanted to make a sort of general remark on today's launch and why we sort of applaud the work that you've done. Um, because obviously Aviva has been uh, very closely involved with the CHRB and the WBA for a while, and there are good reasons for that. So one is I think for a very long time, there's been a real sort of lack of consensus on what social is. Is it human rights? Is it diversity? Is it wages? Are we talking about modern slavery? And I think investors and companies have got themselves in a bit of a twist on how to deal with social issues. What should we be prioritizing? And then the other reason I think is that even once you've understood what social is, you may not necessarily have the information that you need as an investor to go away and speak to companies or to do further analysis. So on both fronts, I think the social framework now essentially provides that bit of, that dollop of cream on your piece of pie, essentially saying, you know, here's your framework, here's your data, now get stuck in. So for, I th for that, I think, I think we should be very appreciative of what's happening here today. Um, and then I just wanted to flag sort of three points and reflections on what the data is throwing up and some of the challenges I think that raises for investors and Kimmy will kill me for going over my three minutes. But um, firstly, I think now that we have the framework, one of the key things that needs to happen, given the lack of disclosure, is to mainstream this framework and set of expectations. Because clearly one of the most interesting but alarming aspects of this assessment is the massive gap in disclosure. So companies that don't report any data at all, and I think that's over 100 companies, and then companies that disclose virtually nothing. So most of the companies being assessed. And given that the baseline assessment covers the basics, you know, does the company have a commitment to respect human rights, to respect health and safety of workers? Does it have a public statement on prohibiting bribery and corruption? These are the very basics that we would expect companies to have. So we have to assume that there is a significant level of underreporting going on. But equally, I think as shareholders, we should be concerned about these gaps and work on the basis that <clears throat> until we see evidence of disclosure and practice, companies are not meeting our baseline expectations on responsible business conduct. And I would hope that through the social kick, and I'm, I'm, I'm hoping Camille will um, talk to this later, there will be opportunities to work not only with other investors, but also others, many on the call, I hope today, because I think in, we have to work together now to mainstream this framework. Um, the other point I wanted to flag is that I'd argue, even though we have this data now, that there is much more work needed to be done to convince investors, shareholders of the systemic risks posed by inequality. I'd argue that we've only just started to see investors and financial institutions embrace the idea that climate change poses an existential threat to society and the economy. We're so much further away from understanding the connection between rights abuses and social and economic instability. So we have to ask ourselves questions. Do people outside of ESG teams, the people that manage money, understand and accept that exploitative working conditions, low wages are bad for society and the economy, or do they consider them to be a necessary function of modern business models? Is there even an understanding or a willingness to accept that addressing inequalities in societies requires redistributive policies and practices? So shifting power and capital away from one set of actors to another. And you could argue that that understanding is currently lacking and you can see that through some of the some of the um, examples of poor practice that we see endemic issues in in sectors such as the garment industry where we see poverty wages that are widespread child labor abuses in agricultural and mineral supply chains etc so i think we as a community have much more to do to confront this very difficult question um, to, to get investors to understand this as a systemic issue and to encourage them and, and support them to be able to engage on this, both with companies, but also within their own institutions. And then the final point, I promise. Um, so redistribution is urgently needed because how companies treat people has a direct bearing and influence over how effective or successful their efforts to mitigate and adapt to the impacts of climate change and biodiversity loss. I think it's important, even if it feels repetitive, to keep reminding each other about this point, because we cannot reasonably expect, for instance, a consumer goods company 
to successfully reduce its impact on natural systems, say in the tea supply chain, if its producers are already struggling to provide workers with a decent wage and they feel compelled to extract as much as they can from their farmland or for an auto company to deliver on its deforestation commitments unless it fully respects the rights of local communities living in the forest ecosystems that may be at risk from expanding rubber production. So the circumstances of people are key to realizing those collective ambitions because they are both the defenders and enablers of that environmental transition. So those were the, the kind of key points that I wanted to flag uh, in response to today's um, data. Thanks, Camille. Great, thank you, Vaidi. And thank you for linking the S to also all the other topics um, that, that are connected. Um, and, and this is why we've put the social framework at the heart of WBA system. And so um, this assessment will count for some of the mark for all the companies assessed on the other transformations as well, because they're inherently linked. Um, and you've also talked about the importance of working together for a kind of shared understanding of what it, inequality and, and all these issues. And so um, I think James, I'm going to bring in to finish this first round um, on reactions to the results. And then after this, we'll go into a bit more of the forward looking what should we do about it? Um, part of the panel. Over to you, James. Great, thanks, Camille. So, first of all, uh, yeah, hashtag happy birthday, Tara, has to be said. Um, but I'd like to begin by, by thanking Dan for that great presentation and then thanking the whole WBA team really for, for elevating these important findings as part of the, the social transformation uh, baseline analysis. I think that the report itself makes for very sobering reading and I think really needs to, to act as a, as a wake up call for, for many of us in this in this space as, as individuals active in the in the quote unquote social sustainability space. I think many of us are often certainly suspected that our efforts on the social side of the sustainable development agenda are, are struggling to keep pace with the momentum that we're perhaps seeing on the, the climate side or even things like the circular economy or biodiversity side. But I think this report underlines just how much we have to do across these, these baseline issues and hopefully can serve as something of a, of a watershed moment for us um, across public, private uh, and, and a whole range of sectors to accelerate the focus and momentum around these, these topics. And for me, as, as uh, Mary was alluding to, one of the reasons why the findings are so troubling is that they, they belie a fundamental lack of preparedness to tackle the systemic inequality. And I think that the reality is that while while inequality has been a part of, of societies over the ages, we've now reached a, a tipping point fundamentally. And I think inequality of, of income, of wealth, of voice, of well-being uh, has become a, an urgent systemic risk and a risk that is every bit as, as urgent as the, as the climate emergency. You know, we're seeing vast numbers of people that have been left behind by the exponential growth over the last couple of decades. We're seeing social cohesion starting to, to erode. We're seeing diminishing trust in key institutions, rising civil and political conflicts. And, and all of this is leaving our societies very incapable of tackling a lot of the other critical challenges that, that we're facing. So perceived injustice and loss of faith in the system is really contributing to a, to a cascade of consequences with really quite dire implications for our societies and fundamentally for businesses as well around around the world and we've seen this highlighted very clearly over the last few weeks by a steady drumbeat of different reports and insights coming out we've seen inequality related risks made up of the to making up two of the, the top five risks in the latest world economic forum annual risks report where erosion of social cohesion was highlighted as the risk factor that was experiencing the most exponential uh, increase We've seen Oxfam's incredibly powerful inequality kills report furnishes with yet more statistics that seem to get more and more terrifying year on year. And this year's findings, I think the inequalities contribute to, to the death of at least one person every four seconds, really hammering home that existential and urgent nature of, of the crisis for many. And we've also seen a, a global lack of optimism underlined by the, the latest Edelman Trust Barometer, as well as uh, an expectation highlighted there for business leaders to play a much more visible role in addressing issues like wage inequality and tackling discrimination. And so I think today's launch is, is a, a cherry on, on that cake, if you like. It's an important addition to this landscape, underlining in no uncertain terms that many businesses around the world are failing 
very much to to address behaviors that bring about or exacerbate inequality um, and are really failing to, to fulfill their potential to provide solutions to it across these critical foundations of social transformation. On the other hand, though, I would say quickly that it is interesting to note that at least one of the CSI commitments was met by at least one company. So it's not a complete disaster. We are seeing business leadership out there. We just need to make sure that this is the norm rather than the exception and to ensure that all businesses are active across all of these different areas. And I think what has happened historically is that many of these issues have been seen as a, a buffet of optional engagement areas for business rather than a holistic, you really must do this agenda. This is what society expects of you. This is what investors expect of you, et cetera. So that's something that I think that the social transformation framework is really helping to, to address and something that we at WBCSD are also working to tackle through a new initiative called the, the Business Commission to Tackle Inequality, which is bringing a cross-sectoral group of leaders together to help steer the, the development of a, a clear and compelling action agenda for business when it comes to tackling inequality. And we look forward to, to working closely with WBA on that over the course of this year. So I'll, I'll finish there and just thank again the WBA team for all these insights and underline again that I think these findings represent not only a call to, to action for the, for the companies involved in the assessments, but also to, to all of us to think about how we can work together more closely, how we can do more to shift business performance and how we can accelerate uh, our efforts to, to really support social transformation in, uh, in, in view of enhancing our, our chances of tackling inequality with the, the urgency it demands. So thanks. Okay, thank you, James, and, and to all four of you for these comments. We're doing well on time. Um, and yes, absolutely, there is business leadership out there. Um, and I think actually Dan mentioned there's, um, there's not uh, a single area where we don't see some companies um, kind of meeting the requirements. And so it's very possible and highlights the fact that, yeah, some are doing it, but also the, the gap with all the companies that are not meeting those requirements. Um, one thing that is very clear from the results, but also from the remarks from all of you is that um, it, we need to see a change uh, in the way business considers its risks and impacts on people. Um, and with today's event, we really didn't want to stop um, at sounding the alarm. We also wanted to look forward uh, to solutions. Um, what can we all do uh, and what should we all do so that the situation is different uh, by the time these companies are assessed again. Um, and so actually for the past few months, we have been working at WBA and with partners, uh, including all four of you on, on the call today, um, to set up what we call collective impact coalitions that Baidi mentioned or KICS. Um, and one of these kicks um, is focused on human rights and human rights due diligence. The idea is to build on all the work that has been done and is being done already, uh, some of which you've mentioned already and we'll go into it uh, a bit more now, uh, but to build on this work to drive better respect for human rights and accelerate that change through coordinated multi-stakeholder action. Um, so I'll share more about this um, after we've, we've gone through the, the panel, but uh, for now, I wanted to turn to the panelists again uh, with a second question for each of you, which is very much forward looking. What solutions do you see? Um, what do you think needs to happen? Uh, we've already started getting into that. And what work are you undertaking to, to lead to that change? Um, Andres, can I go to you to start this round? Sure. Thanks. Thanks for that. Um, practical actions. Um, I think based on, on some of the comments that we've, we've heard is like for companies embed your human rights due diligence within core systems uh, and risk assessment, build capacity internally and culturally within companies, create linkages between those departments that are isolated and the, and the operational ones, uh, be more transparent and humble, let's say, in, in your journey towards human rights due diligence because everyone is at different speeds and having that responsibility is quite an important weight. For us, uh, again, the most important part as well is the engagement with civil society and the fact that they, that they should be part of this conversation. So you should map, map the, this, these actors, engage them and include them in your, in your, uh, in your process. Um, I think the construction of these multi-stakeholder uh, coalitions is key because uh, we come from different areas of expertise. And I think 
uh, between all of us, we are able to build those mechanisms and of leverage to push companies through market mechanisms, but also through regulatory uh, incentives to be compliant with international best practice. And that's something that uh, I think we should really focus on building leverage for those instances in which we don't have the regulation behind to push companies. There is enough, uh, let's say, market forces, like we see the cases of investors and others, uh, to be able to push companies to, to, to engage and do the right thing. Um, I think uh, we should be getting some traction soon with the Impact Coalition, and I'm really looking forward to, to getting to those discussions with, with colleagues. And um, yeah, I would encourage companies to be more engaging, more open, and, and, and joining this type of this type of dialogue. I'll leave it there for now. Uh, thanks. Great. Thank you very much, um, Andres. Um, Tara, over to you. Thanks, Kami. Um, I'm going to start with picking up on, uh, on a term that Vadi um, used, which is mainstreaming. And that's going to be both mainstreaming within businesses, mainstreaming within the global community of actors around business and human rights and around social development, uh, and also mainstreaming within states. So picking up on the state's issue, this need for human rights due diligence regulation. Um, first, let me point out that this is an ongoing expectation and obligation of businesses or of states under international human rights laws. This is an existing obligation that we should have already seen compliance with. Um, but a lot of these, these laws that we are seeing come up now have some sort of reference to an agency who can help develop rules and uh, indicators of compliance for human rights due diligence. And I'd like to see those states start tying the, the corporate human rights benchmark and other kinds of indicators into their regulation. Um, regulations are, I'm using this in the Anglo-American differentiation between regulation and legislation. Regulations are inherently something that are a little bit more easy to adapt, so they can change um, as they go forward quite easily without having to go through the legislative process. And by tying uh, human rights due diligence compliance to social indicators and, and to strong metrics like what we see with the CHRB, we can actually sort of help solidify for businesses what it is that they're expected to do. And there's really no reason for states to kind of reinvent the wheel on this. So we, we have good methodology. We have methodology that complies with the UN guiding principles that would help states realize their own obligations in addition to facilitating business responsibility to respect human rights and, and to be strong social agents for good. So I'd like to see that kind of link develop within some of these regulations. Um, I think mainstreaming into businesses is going to take a little bit more thoughtfulness and a little bit more engagement. And here I'd like to see businesses really start ensuring that they're a part of the broader community of actors that are working on business and human rights. I'm sort of always surprised in November, the UN has its annual forum on business and human rights. And several years in a row, my friends at various businesses have not been able to join the forum because their companies are asking them to do other stuff back home. What that does is take them out of the community of actors. They're missing out on opportunities to learn about best practices. They're missing out on opportunities to make connections with other stakeholders. Um, they're missing out on the hard conversations that actually can move this agenda and their compliance forward. And it's, it goes back to that issue of investing in your people. If you want to invest in your human rights team, you need to give them the tools, the training, and the opportunity to learn best practices from other, from other actors. Um, I'm going to conclude by talking about mainstreaming with investors. Um, it's not just because Vaidi is here. I have to say, I, I'm not somebody who gets the opportunity to praise companies very frequently. Um, and it's gonna seem like today I'm just metting out praise all over the place. Um, but I have long been a fan of the fact that Aviva takes the lead in this area and has been um, a low key and consistent partner within the business and human rights community. We, we often have businesses who step forward about their human rights commitments about six months before a scandal hits. So anytime that they show up suddenly at the forum and, and have big promises, I usually get quite skeptical and assume that we're six months from finding out that they, they've just, you know, engaged in genocide someplace that we, you know, haven't been paying attention to. 
But Aviva has been consistent in its commitments and it's been a consistent partner in this. Um, and I think that we need more businesses, more investors to team up with them, not just within what I hope will be their involvement in the kick, um, but also in other entities like Invest for Human Rights. Uh, there are, they are a key stakeholder, and if they can start mainstreaming the indicators into their own work, if they can start using the indicators as part of their engagement, institutional investors do have their own human rights responsibilities as corporate actors or as commercial actors. Um, and so I'd like to start seeing them really grab onto this, this tool and use it as, as a persuasive means of engaging with corporations because I can scream as much as I want to from, from what people think is my ivory tower. Hopefully you can see my wall so you know it's not really an ivory tower that I sit in. Um, but I can scream as much as I want to about the need to integrate this, but it's actually the investors that will, actually, will be able to move this forward. And we have seen in the last 10 years, real uptake by investors around these social indicators, around these tools for pushing forward business compliance. And I'd like to see them start mainstreaming these kinds of indicators into their asks. So thanks, Kami. Great, thank you, Tara. Um, Fadi, I'll give you a second to think on that and I'll go to James first. Um, so over to you, James, um, and then we'll go to Fadi after that. Yeah, I very much agree with uh, with Andres and Tara on all of those, all of those points. I think there's, there's a sort of a clear, in my mind, a clear sequence of, of things that definitely need to happen. I think first of all is, is driving understanding throughout the business community of, as I was saying before, that's, that must do agenda. This and this, you know, this framework and this analysis by WB has a great start to that. Really being clear on what has to sit at the heart of business efforts. Defining clearly what we're talking about when we're talking about the S in, in ESG. So it's not just a mishmash of a random data points that are collected across a whole range of different areas that we're very clear on what the performance areas that we're, we're expecting are and you know the hope would be in a year from now um that we have ceos you know ceos are now perfectly equipped to talk about 1.5 degrees they're perfectly equipped to talk about nature loss and some of these other but uh, nature related topics but if i ask the ceo to explain to me what the ins and outs of, of decent work are at the moment they, most of them are probably struggles and we have to have business leaders who are equipped with with this narrative as well and understanding the areas that they're they're having to to, to to drive performance on within their organizations and then we have to have the mechanisms that are leveling the playing fields uh, from a regulatory point of view so the companies that are leading in this place are not exposing themselves to you know completely unrealistic levels of risk you know, companies committing to to meet living wages throughout its supply chain. That should be a good thing that policy is, is supporting. Um, and uh, yeah, the company is not exposed to, to the, the issues that, that come with that. And that there's not a, you know, a backlash in terms of uh, other, uh, um, the gains that come from that in the broader economic sphere just being enjoyed by all companies, including those that are, that are not moving on the issue. So we need to create that little playing field and then make sure that we have the systems in place to, to really drive, uh, investor behavior change so that the investors can start rewarding the best performers in this field as well. And we can mobilize the power of capitalism uh, and our current capitalist model to, to drive changes in this space as well, which it is already starting to do on the on the climate side albeit, uh, with, with varying degrees of uh, success, but definitely the this, this shift has started to happen. So what lessons can we learn from, from what's playing out in the, the climate space and apply them to, to the inequality space in the human rights field as well would be, would be my two cents. Great. Thank you very much, James. Um, I'm going to go to you, Vaidi, and then um, quickly after that, we'll go into the Q&A because we've got uh, quite a few questions coming in. Um, but yeah, over to you, Vaidi. Okay, so be quick, basically. Um, uh, so yeah, just to reflect on um, what Aviva's been doing, not just um, ourselves on our own, but with others, because as Tara says, it's it's sort of inadequate just to have a few investors doing good things here and there. It's, it's really important to have the whole industry doing um, doing good work. So um, we've been using the CHRB data and likely we'll be using the social data in our company research. We've also been voting against the management of companies that score zero on all human rights due diligence indicators on the CHRB. And we'll continue to, consider to uh, continue to explore expanding that now that we have the WBA social data. 
we've been working with the Investor Alliance for Human Rights, which is this brilliant um, organization that's coordinating and corralling um, some very engaged investors on uh, engaging with the laggard companies on the CHRB, and we're now planning our escalation steps around that. Um, so using the CHRB methodology and increasing the, the WBA social framework indicators as a basis for getting under the skin of companies' approaches to human rights. Um, but more generally, I'd say as an observation, I think investors can and should be braver with social issues beyond engagement. So I think lots of time goes into spending time convincing companies of the importance of human rights or decent work. Um, and you know, as we've all said and heard, human rights obligations of companies have been articulated in international standards and norms for some time now. Um, and so then there's this process of educating companies, allowing them time to adopt, you know, some of or all of our asks. And then this process is repeated over a number of years. However, I'd suggest that now, you know, with regulation coming in and increased expectations of companies and, and uh, from wider stakeholders, that the time is right to go faster and to act with greater urgency and to use all the tools at our disposal. And um, we're starting to see more and more examples of this. So there's a brilliant little organization called Share Action that is doing exactly this. So organizing investors on social issues to escalate and file resolutions that can often then be the prompt for companies to take action that it might have taken a few years otherwise to. So I think we need to start thinking about these kinds of things um, as investors on social issues. And then the other thing I just, uh, as a way to illustrate sort of something specific that we're doing, um, that we've started to do more recently. So Aviva has recently launched a, a fund, a social fund, and the fund has the issue of social inequality firmly in mind. So what, we've, what we're doing is using the WBA social framework as a tool for guiding our stewardship of companies in the fund. So these are publicly listed companies, mostly large cap. So all have a lot more work to do on all of the areas within the framework. So initially what we'll be doing is focusing our efforts on ensuring companies meet um, the expectations under HRDD. So using the indicators from the framework, because we think this is a necessary first building block, but then we'll also be engaging with companies on living wages. So across the value chain. So expecting companies to start making these commitments to living wages over time. Um, a big part of this approach will be uh, engaging with stakeholders outside of the company. So we will need to expand our reach um, to ensure that we're aware of companies' impacts from those that are directly affected. And then ultimately where we don't see progress with these um, asks over a defined period of time, we've committed to escalating our engagement and ultimately where we don't see progress on these specific asks divesting from the fund. Um, so this is a very new and ambitious sort of concept for us, but in our minds, we would hope that the principles and asks that we're that we're putting into companies will be rolled out more widely and that the social framework that WBA have created can be used by others in, in similar work. Um, so then I'll stop there. Thanks, Kimi. Great. Thank you, Vaidi, and thank you for sharing a bit about the, the fund, because um, that's, that's great. And I'm sure we, you might get some questions come through in, in the chat about this as well. Um, Right, so we've had quite a few questions coming um, through the chat and the Q&A box. Um, so we take some of, I direct some of these questions to the panelists. I think some of them are uh, directly related to the, um, the data or the results. So um, I'll go to Dan uh, for those. Um, and so let's start with two of them. Um, and actually the first one, I'll uh, give it, to you, Dan, and then the second one to the panelists. So the first one for Dan, um, looking at the data, there are companies listed uh, as um, NA. Um, can you explain this? I, I know this is a, a practical question, but we'll get it. So I, I'll yeah. go through both questions, Dan, okay. and then I'll go to you for the response um, so that panelists can start thinking about the second one. So can you explain these NA companies um, and how would I know if my corporation is one of the NA companies? So I take it this might come from a, an investor. Um, and then question to the panelists, um, are policymakers uh, such as the EU Commission listening to the recommendation on integra integrating indica indicators like um, WBAs or at least the thinking um, behind the indicators into upcoming regulation? Dan, over to you. Great. 
so on the first one, um, I've just been told by the team in the background that apparently there's a there's a filter applied to column M, which we need to, to sort. That's why it says 86 companies. There should be more companies than that that say non-applicable. So we have the way that we, we've got with the 1,000 companies, we've got the 700 that were benchmarked last year and went through the benchmark cycle, which means the companies were given the, you know, the, the survey and the draft scores and they were engaged with or given the opportunity to engage. They had the right to reply then they were part of the publication process. So that's the, the 700, 300, which are the non-applicable is what we've kind of labeled them at the moment, are the companies which haven't yet had a chance to reply. So we're not going to name and, and shame them or name and fame them uh, as it were at the moment in that Excel sheet. Most of those companies should be going through into benchmarks this year. So for instance, the 400 financial system transformation companies should be getting their draft scores at the end of uh, April, I think it is for that. So that's why you've got uh, some of the companies that aren't uh, named in there. If it's a particular one, send us info.social at World Benchmark Alliance and we can have a chat about um, whether, you, whether your company was one of the ones that was in there, because it's likely you're in the, the SCG 2000. On the policy one, we have been engaged quite a lot. So we have a policy team. We've been heavily engaged in the, in the European discussions, including with allies such as Frank Bold. Um, yes, we have been pushing in terms of the previous findings, and now we've got this new data will definitely push in terms of what we can show and how this adds to the picture, both in terms of the necessity for the due diligence law to actually pass, but also what it says, because it's going to take several years for, for instance, in the EU to set up a monitoring mechanism to actually show what's happening. This is one of the things we found with the human rights benchmarking and the snapshots is that um, no one was actually doing this. No one was saying this is the state of play at a national level or a regional level. So that's the thing that we kind of provide and push forward. In terms of the taxonomy, yes. So for instance, in the draft social taxonomy thinking, there's references in there to our indicators and we spoke to the teams working on that. So um, yeah, we're, we're definitely plugged in there and we want to see this stuff taken forward on a, on a policy and engagement level, um, which is why we, we have a policy team for that. Um, Great, thank you, Dan. Um, do any of the panelists want to comment on the policy question yet? Yeah, Tara, I can see you raising your hand. I was going to go to you as well. <laughs> uh, so the answer is sometimes they're listening. Uh, I'm not convinced the European Commission is, but I'm also no longer convinced the European Commission is serious about a real human rights due diligence law. So um, I do think legislators in the member states, by the way, agree with me on that because we are seeing new legislative initiatives and I am being approached by new states asking how do they develop their own human rights due diligence law because they're no longer convinced the European Commission is going to be serious about this. So um, some of those states are listening. Some of those states are serious about developing something that makes sense, that complies with the UN guiding principles, that gives clarity for businesses as to what is expected of them. There's a lot of concern amongst the business community that as we see these regulations pop up in different places and they're not they're not 100% aligned with each other, right? So, so you'll have some overlap, but you have a lot of differences. If you look at the French law versus the German law, the German law versus the Norwegian law, the, those laws versus what we have in the Netherlands or the US right now, there's not a cohesive narrative right now amongst these human rights due diligence laws. And I think that the indicators, how we measure compliance with those human rights due diligence laws can help close a bit of that gap. And so my hope is that businesses also recognize the importance of having something like compliance with the CHRB as an indicator of, of human rights due diligence. Um, I think that if we can start, if they can see the value in that, we will start seeing it integrated more into regulation. And I think that there is real value for businesses in having that kind of clarity, that kind of measurable and demonstrable compliance. Um, I don't think it should be the only indicator, but I think that it should be an indicator. Thank you very much, Tara. Um, anyone else want to come in on that um, policy question? Otherwise I've got more coming. Nope, okay, so two more questions. Um, the first one, to what extent must we guard against the responsible business agenda being the next victim of culture wars? For example, Paul Pullman felt the need to call out the attack on woke capitalism um, through FD opinion, sustainable capitalism yesterday. So comments on this. Second question, um, it's good for 
WBA to highlight the importance of tax and lobbying as the foundations of what companies should be doing on the social side. But at this stage, companies are not receiving this message from stakeholders they listen to, from the stakeholders they listen to the most, like their shareholders. Are you seeing any shift here? So on um, tax and lobbying as important foundations for social. And then again, first question was how we guard against the responsible business agenda being the next victim of culture wars. I volunteer to go first. Otherwise, I'll designate someone. I, by I the can't hands. stand the awkward silence. <laughs> um, <laughs> just, uh, yeah, I guess on Michael's question, I suppose, um, <laughs> I guess we are in some senses blooming do-gooders, but um, th there is a sense that what we're fighting for here and pushing for um, isn't based on some obscure random set of values that we've just thrown together. These are based on values, principles, uh, codes of conduct that have been articulated as I, uh, we were speaking to earlier in international standards and norms. We're, we're not talking, uh, this isn't a foreign language that we're speaking. We're, we're simply highlighting the fact that businesses have a responsibility to do X, Y, and Z. These have been, you know, um, decided on, uh, agreed, and endorsed by various institutions, including um, the private sector. Um, and so I would argue that actually what we're doing at the moment is just an effort to mainstream that notion, to make them a reality, as opposed to championing uh, a set of woke principles and values that um, some people might might object to. Um, this is the this is the pursuit of mainstreaming now, because ultimately what we're fighting for is, um, you know, the the very fabric of society around you know around us crumbling because we simply couldn't get business to do what it what it's basically required to do under international standards and norms. Um, so yeah, I'd, um, I I guess that was a bit of a provocative question, but um, yeah. I don't know if I helped answer that at all. Can I pop in on this? Um, so I think, first of all, I think we're already there. I think it, we have been there for several years that the notion of responsible business conduct is part of that culture wars game. Um, but I think what James said earlier today really needs to be highlighted that the issue of inequality as a threat to our societies and to our global structure is it is one of the most predominant, it is one of the biggest threats to the stability of, of our societies um, and having responsible business conduct, having business and human rights compliance is a necessary component of keeping our societies peaceful. I mean, keeping some level of stability. Andreas and I both work in conflict affected and fragile societies on a pretty regular basis. And one of the, the clearest indicators as to an oncoming uh, civil or non-international non armed conflict is social inequality. It is that that can help you really map out how likely it is that a, a state is going into an armed conflict. Um, and so this notion of responsible business conduct, just as as Vaidi said, just as, as sort of a, um, a set of idealistic principles isn't really a reflection of what we're talking about. What we're talking about are values that are First of all, things that have been developed for 70 years through an international community and through international dialogue. But we're also talking about things that, that the studies show us and experience shows us both qualitatively and quantitatively that we need to handle this. We need to get, get a serious handle on this issue of inequality if we're going to keep some sense of peace and stability within our society. If we don't wanna sort of rush straight to an armed conflict, we need to get get our, our minds wrapped around this. Thank you, Tara. James, over to you, I see you've got your hand up. Yeah, no, there's a fascinating microcosm going on in that in that question itself, right? Because the, the whole occurrence and the nature of these culture wars that are erupting are in and of themselves, I think, a reaction to structural inequality in our societies in many ways as well. In fact, that has become this elite you know, perception of the elite and others and this kind of, the whole notion of woke, I think, is in, in many ways uh, a reaction to inequality or a reaction to uh, certain concepts being pushed through without proper socialization or due diligence or what have you, and things like just transition as well. So I think 
yeah, not, not taking action in this area because you're fearful of that kind of culture war spilling over is is sort of a, a catch-22 scenario on a vicious circle. So we, unless we address some of these issues, we're always going to have this sort of you know, world that is, is divided. So we need to try and, and bring things together through efforts to step up in action in a lot of these areas. Thank you, James. Um, Andres. <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah, I, I was part of the group of, uh, I don't I'm not sure I, I understood fully the, the, the premises of the question, but like I, I would probably answer the, the two questions at the same time a little bit that about the companies that um, that come and engage and are familiar with those standards that at this time already they are quite accepted uh, in the international community across a lot of political spectrums from you know from the most progressive to just economic levels. I mean, like it's not a matter of uh, recent tendencies or or uh, or other visions which we should respect. Everyone looks at these issues with a different lens, political, sociological, or economic or um, let's say mathematically as well. Um, what we are trying to highlight here is the importance of this social stability uh, and respect for human rights as an enabling environment for businesses, but also for democracy and for uh, that, what we call this civic space that is shared by, by companies and by, by civil society. And uh, we do see companies adhering to this increasingly. Uh, we colleagues from the Business and Human Rights Resource Center do this amazing work in compiling all the list of companies and investors and uh, business associations that are uh, asking for EU mandatory due diligence or asking for kind of universal standards in this regard. So I, I, I do see uh, uh, kind of a, a mainstreaming, that, but we still have to, to work on that for sure. Great, thank you. Um... I think we have time for perhaps a co couple more questions. Actually, one of them is, is for you specifically, Vaidi, um, and the other one, I guess, can go to everyone else. Um, so Vaidi, the one for you specifically, um, well, it starts with a congratulations, uh, not the first today. Uh, so congratulations on, on the uh, social fund. Uh, the question is, when will it be launched? Who can invest in the fund? What an invested theme? investing theme will it have um, and expected returns and uh, is the focus on inequality so I don't think you'll have time to answer all of those questions but uh, you can say a bit more about this for everyone else there's a question um, around uh, SMEs uh, so there's the, the person says I, I follow the argument about leveling the playing field but is there a risk that a strong focus on formal policies and disclosures poses a problem for SMEs uh, that are in the supply chains of larger companies? Larger companies may simply transfer costs and responsibilities to their smaller suppliers. Um, Vaidi, I'll go to you first on the fund and then um, we'll go to the second question and then we'll have to close the Q&A. Yeah. Um... So the fund has uh, just launched, actually, it's still um, a, a baby, it's about a month old. Um, uh, it's designed for um, institutional and wholesale investors, so not retail at the moment. Um, and the, the fund's themes align uh, exactly with the WBA's social framework, so um, respect for human rights, promoting decent work and acting ethically. Um, the fund's objective is to help contribute to addressing social inequality. So that's our overarching uh, goal and objective. And the way that we hope that we'll be able to try and uh, deliver that is through those um, engagement expectations on human rights, due diligence and living wage. And over time, we expect that to expand to other areas within the framework. Um, uh, I think that answers most of them. I also did type some of that into the Q&A. So hopefully that um, has gone through. Oh, great. Thanks, Vaidi. Um, on the other question, anyone wants to come in? The, the SMEs and the relationship with um, larger companies with SMEs in their supply chain. Dan, I can see you off mute. Oh, no, Tara. Okay, so I can't answer the question about how it's integrated into the social transformation 
effects and, and indicators. Uh, but I will address the other part, which is, yes, there is a risk that as large companies take this on, they start trying to transfer the costs, the SMEs in their supply chains. Doing so, deeply problematic, contravenes the entire purpose of the exercise, contravenes the responsibility for human rights. Uh, and it's not an inevitable reality. So we have seen businesses in the past who have undertaken promises around visas and immigration, making sure that workers aren't put into essentially um, bonded debt because, uh, or sorry, bonded labor because they've had their visas paid for by, by um, somebody who's helping them get a job in another country. And we've seen large companies take on the responsibility of reimbursing and paying off those debts when they show up in their supply chains. We have seen businesses take on the responsibility of appropriate uh, living wages for their supply chains. We have seen them take on the responsibility of appropriate environmental conditions and examinations for their supply chains. So it's not an inevitability that this will happen. And I think that there are ways in which we can, through legislation, through regulation, and through good business practice and, and industry-wide standards, really respond to that risk to protect SMEs. From a legislative perspective, right now what we're seeing are, are legislation that targets and differentiates between SMEs and large companies, specifically because we recognize that SMEs may not have the, um, the capacity to do the regulatory compliance mechanisms. I do wanna say that in a lot of cases, SMEs are already better placed to be complying with their business and human rights responsibilities. We already see a lot of SMEs who by the nature of their operations, take on board business and human rights considerations, do think through who their supply chain is and understand that. Um, so there isn't a one size, fits all reality for SMEs on these issues. It is a concern. It's one that I think everyone is aware of and tracking in, in the response to these legislative and regulatory initiatives. Great, thank you, Tara. Any burning comments from anyone else on this question? Um, otherwise I'll close the Q and A. No burning comments, great. Um, well, thank you so much, uh, and thank you to all of you who sent questions. Hopefully the ones that we didn't get to uh, live uh, have been answered or will be answered shortly in writing. Um, thank you for, to the panelists for your great comments um, and really interesting exchange. I, before concluding, so I mentioned earlier that we have been working on a collective impact coalition or KIC to drive progress on human rights through collaborative action. And today, as we launch the social transformation baseline, I'm also very pleased to share that we will be um, working with our four panelists and other organizations who have been pushing for responsible business conduct to accelerate and mainstream progress on one particularly crucial topic, which is human rights due diligence. Um, We'll do this through two work streams, one focused on individual company change and one focused on system change. So changing the ecosystem in which companies operate. Um, we'll be stepping up efforts um, across these, both of these work streams uh, for the rest of the year and, and beyond. But the idea is very simple. We need rapid change and this change can only happen at scale and at speed with collaboration across stakeholder groups and um, with alignment at its heart and grounded in the evidence that comes from the benchmarks, um, for example, and, and other sources. So we really want this to be a global movement um, and we want it to be ambitious. So if this sounds like something that you would like to be part of, please get in touch with us. Um, we're arriving at time, so if uh, Dan, perhaps, or someone could flag up the last slide that we had on the deck, um, because that has a bit of information to conclude on, um, which is essentially the link to the report um, and a reminder also to use the hashtag when companies value people and also the email address if you want to get in touch with us about the baseline 
um, and or about the kick. So we're at time. Thank you uh, again to our speakers. Thank you to all of you for watching this uh, online. Um, and I look forward to going on social media to see all the posts with the hashtag when companies value people. Wishing you all a good rest of your day. Thank you and goodbye. Thanks, all. Thanks panelists. Thanks for all the questions as well that have come through. Sorry if we haven't got to all of them.